This video is brought to you by Skillshare. Hi, welcome to another Cold Fusion video. The year was 1969. The Beatles had just recorded their final album together, Abbey Road. The early internet, ARPANET, was being built in a Stanford classroom, and Neil Armstrong had just uttered those famous words. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. We had just landed a person on the moon, and soon, children everywhere began dreaming about how when they grew up, they too would go to the moon. It was a wondrous time filled with optimism, except the technology didn't evolve. Those dreams never amounted to reality. Instead of growing a whole industry around space, humans barely made it back to the moon. Only 12 people have ever visited the extraterrestrial surface. But just like the United States and the Soviets were locked in a space race in the 1960s, today, 50 years on, we're starting to see a different kind of space race. NASA is firing up its rockets once again to go back to the moon, and a multitude of small startups and industries have sprung up around this renewed interest in space. Elon Musk, Richard Branson, and Jeff Bezos are all racing to see who will conquer the new space industry. In this episode, let's take a look at the new space race. You are watching Cold Fusion TV. So why has there been such a resurging interest in space and the moon? Well, put simply, the economics are starting to make sense now. New industries are already forming around space. For example, 3D printing human organs has become much simpler without the need for scaffold structures thanks to zero gravity. Also, the manufacturing of more energy efficient fiber optic cables also becomes possible in space. Space manufacturing could create many more enabling technologies which could lead to industries that don't even exist yet. We'll explore these later in the video, but going to space and the moon is more than just a better way to make products. Extraterrestrial colonization is becoming a popular idea, and space tourism has become a fascination of billionaires and dreamers alike. The Artemis Lunar Program is NASA's attempt to return to the moon. Companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin are competing to provide their services of commercial lunar payloads. The mission for NASA's Artemis program is to, quote, land the first woman and next man on the moon. The program intends to land on a never before visited part of the moon, the South Pole, by 2024. The mission would give astronauts 6.5 days on the lunar surface, more than double the longest duration of the previous lunar mission. NASA also plans to make good use of time on the moon by setting up equipment before the astronauts reach the surface and engineering a summon feature on their rovers so they can self-drive to the landing site of the astronauts. According to NASA, this is the first step in sending humans to Mars. Using what they learned during this lunar program, there is hope for a future Mars program to begin, and in their own words, the next era of exploration. I am the first NASA administrator that was not alive when we had people on the moon. I was born in 1975, our last mission was in 1972. I don't have that memory. We cannot let another generation go by where we don't have that memory. We need to get to the moon. This is the Artemis generation. We need to own it. We need to take control of it and we need to make it happen. As NASA turns to private companies to help them reach the moon, the world's richest man jumped at the opportunity. Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin has recently partnered with Lockheed Martin, North Grumman and Draper to build a vehicle which will deliver and return payloads including astronauts to and from the moon's surface. More recently, Blue Origin has showcased their lunar lander. It was called Blue Moon. They hope that this will be used in the 2024 NASA lunar missions. Bezos wants Blue Origin to help establish a lunar base and provide NASA with a cargo carrier service support to and from the moon. Blue Origin's vehicles are expected to carry 3.6 metric tons of goods. As he explained, it takes 24 times less energy to take off from the moon than Earth. Jeff Bezos is investing around $1 billion a year into Blue Origin, anticipating that the logistics of space could prove to be very lucrative. It's time to go back to the moon, this time to stay. 
And it's this generation's job to build that road to space so that the future generations can unleash their creativity. When that is possible, when the infrastructure is in place, just as it was for me in 1994 to start Amazon, when we have that infrastructure in place for the future space entrepreneurs, you will see amazing things happen. And it will happen fast. I guarantee it. People are so creative once they're unleashed. But the heat is on, and Blue Origin isn't the only one trying to win these contracts. SpaceX, along with several other companies, have been selected to be part of NASA's program. However, acceptance by NASA doesn't guarantee any of these companies' contracts. Rather, NASA is building their lunar program to have a pool of companies capable of delivering a payload to the moon. Effectively, it's a special club of possible contract winners for each time NASA needs a payload sent in the future. Companies like Blue Origin and SpaceX will go head to head in building their best vehicle for NASA's needs. Blue Origin might have a strong competitor to face. If we want to get the, the public real fired up, I think we've got we to gotta have a base on the moon, you know? Like, that would be pretty cool. Um, and then going beyond that, getting people to Mars. You know? Yeah. You know, having some permanent presence uh, on another heavenly body. That's the continuance of the dream of Apollo that uh, I think um, people are really looking for. Elon Musk was perhaps one of the first pioneers of this new space industry when he founded SpaceX in 2002. Right now, SpaceX has big plans for the future colonization of Mars. However, in the meantime, the company is also providing satellite launching, space tourism, and as mentioned, has recently joined forces with NASA for their moon missions. Firstly, let's look at satellites, where SpaceX has a big interest. Their Starlink project is an ambitious effort for SpaceX to launch a network of small satellites into space to provide a global, reliable, and fast internet service. The satellite launching industry comprises 77% of the $360 billion space industry as a whole, so it is core to the future of the entire space industry. Roughly speaking, Elon Musk is literally building his own internet, and recently he showcased the technology in the most Elon Musk way possible, by sending a tweet using a Starlink satellite. Coverage of the Starlink system is expected to be available in the United States and Canada from 2020, with nearly global coverage to follow a year later. It's an ambitious expansion effort, but not everyone is happy with the project. Astronomers have recently been complaining that their views are being obstructed by Starlink satellites. Currently, the company has launched about 122 of a possible 42,000 satellites, meaning that this interference with astronomical studies may become far greater in the future. In the field of the space internet, SpaceX has some competitors, with Amazon trying to launch their satellite internet in the form of Project Cooper, while another company, OneWeb, is attempting to do the same. But in saying this, SpaceX appears to be in the driver's seat, having the capabilities to launch and is indeed already implementing their Starlink project. In the grand scheme of things, providing a global internet service could be a big financial payoff, while at the same time could improve the lives of many people who traditionally have been disadvantaged with poor or no internet coverage in their part of the world. Remember, access to the internet brings all of the world's collective knowledge with it. Another area for SpaceX is space tourism. In a previous video, I did cover SpaceX's Dear Moon project, and it's a pretty interesting concept. It's basically a moon flyby that would last six days and is proposed to launch in 2023. Japanese billionaire Yusaku Maizawa partially funded the project and has dubbed the flight an art project. He plans to bring along half a dozen artists with him on the trip, and he hopes that this trip would inspire artists to promote world peace. But yet, for space tourism, there's yet another player who wants a piece of the pie. His name is Richard Branson. We have nearly 800 astronauts who have signed up wanting to go up. And next year, we'll start taking people to space. The resources and the money that we make from that, um, we will be putting to 
uh, things like point-to-point -point travel, with, um, that will be expanded and, and, and one day do point-to-point -point travel. We've got another spaceship company called Virgin Orbit, which will be putting satellites into orbit uh, later this year. Doing things a little different than his counterparts, Richard Branson is not planning to launch from Earth. Virgin Orbit, funded by a $1 billion investment from sister company Virgin Galactic, is planning to launch its first rockets, which will deliver small satellites into orbit by early 2020. But instead of launching from the ground like SpaceX and Blue Origin, Virgin Orbit plans to do it with a little help. They're going to strap their rocket to the wing of a Boeing 747. The plan is to launch mid-air, increasing reliability and reducing cost. Sister company Virgin Galactic, having recently debuted as the first and only publicly traded space company with their IPO on the New York Stock Exchange, is focusing on space tourism with similar launch mechanisms. They followed by unveiling their new Under Armour spacesuit for suborbital flight. Virgin Galactic has also started its astronaut readiness program. The program will provide nutrition and fitness for some of the world's first space tourists. Despite this, space tourism isn't available to the masses just yet. A 90-minute suborbital flight on Virgin's Galactic Spaceship 2 will set you back $250,000. But that's not to say that Virgin Galactic doesn't have customers. 600 people have already signed up to fly. The company is looking to launch flights in 2020. Blue Origin is also setting its sights on the tourist market planning to give customers 10 minutes at the edge of space in the newly tested and developed New Shepard rockets. Along with the giants that are SpaceX, Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic, this emerging industry, dubbed New Space, has given rise to many smaller startups. Made in Space is a space manufacturing startup from Silicon Valley, funded by a $20 million investment from NASA. This company is pioneering 3D printing in space and even has their own 3D printer on the International Space Station. They're charging agencies a fee to 3D print new tools as required by astronauts. A company called Space Pharma has sent its unmanned mini laboratory to the International Space Station where it's conducting experiments in microgravity. Another startup called Planet Labs is using its 200 small satellites to take approximately 1.4 million images of the Earth each day. They're using this data to help monitor and improve agriculture on Earth. And that's just naming some of the few companies delving into this new and exciting industry. So knowing that this is a YouTube video, there's naturally going to be cynical reductionists and they're probably thinking, what's the point of all of this? This is just such a waste of money that could be spent better elsewhere. Why even go to space in the first place? Well, I've mentioned this in a previous video and it's worth highlighting again. Technologies that are developed and used in space travel could benefit all of us in the long run. Many things that you use every day have come to be thanks to NASA pushing the boundaries. Here are some examples. Digital image sensors were developed by a NASA scientist. His task was to engineer a miniature camera for missions. The CMOS, or Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor, is a type of image sensor that's widely used in smartphones and countless other mini cameras like GoPros. Enriched baby food is another NASA pioneered invention. Through an attempt to create a recycling agent for long-term space flights, research was carried out into microalgae in bread mold. The scientists who were part of the program spun this off to create baby formulas. And today, around 90% of baby formula contains the substance based off microalgae. LASIK technology originated in the 1980s from NASA's attempts to use lasers to track the docking of space vehicles. Eventually, this technology would fall into the hands of optometrists. LASIK allows people to forego traditional glasses and regain their quality of sight. And this is by no means all. The list keeps going. Thermal blankets, memory foam, portable cordless vacuums, freeze drying, NASA have invented or helped to pioneer in some capacity thousands of technologies. In fact, NASA's technology transfer program ensures that the research and development completed at NASA is passed on to the public to maximize the benefit of the nation. They even release an annual magazine called Spin-Off featuring some of the newest technology made available to the public. 
And it's fair to say, most or even all of this wouldn't exist without scientists and engineers pushing the boundaries because of the tough demands of space travel. So in conclusion, we are living in very interesting times. As one industry dies, another is born. And just as many people looked up in awe as Neil Armstrong took those first steps on the moon, we are about to take our own first step all over again. This time with renewed interest, better technology and a better vision for the new space industry. New manufacturing possibilities in microgravity, the possibility of colonizing the moon and Mars, taking a vacation in space, the currently unknown but future spin-off technologies that can come from this are all great reasons for investing resources into building this new industry. What other industries or enabling technologies will we discover as we head into the unknown? Space may be dark, but in this instance, the future is bright. So what do you guys think? Do you think that we'll have a brand new space industry? Or are you completely skeptical and think that this will all amount to nothing? If you do want more on space, check out my previous episode. I'll leave a link after this. It covers the story of the first man in space and also explains why the Russians were so much better than the Americans at everything space related during the 1960s. So in finishing off, I do get a lot of people asking me how I do certain things like editing or productivity. If you do want to make your 2020 a year of self-improvement, a great place to start is by learning a new skill. Skillshare has you covered. There's a great course by Thomas Frank on productivity. Here, you'll learn how to build a custom system to get ideas from your head into motion. I especially liked the concept of review days to stop all your tasks running away from you. For Cold Fusion viewers, Skillshare is giving away two months of premium membership to help you explore your creativity if you click the link in the description box. And after this, it's about $10 a month. And with all of that, that wraps up the video. This has been Dagogo and you've been watching Cold Fusion. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you again soon for the next video. Cheers guys. Have a good one. Cold Fusion. It's new thinking.